Welcome to the Baseball Insiders on this beautiful Thursday. I'm Adam Weiner, and filling in for Robert Murray today is Ian McMillan. Ian, you're here with me in New York. Uh, you are Canadian, and so I want to thank you personally for filling my mouth with smog. Uh, we canceled some baseball games for smog yesterday. Uh, not going to sugarcoat it. It uh, really sucks here right now. <laughs> Yeah, and not only is it Canadian, but the smoke is actually specifically from Nova Scotia, my home province. So uh, it hunted me down. I thought I had escaped the fires, uh, but the smoke has hunted me down. So, yeah, it's partially my fault. The, yeah, the, what is this? Frickin' lost with the frickin' smoke monster? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're having almost no fun here, uh, but it's clearing up a little bit. It seems like Philadelphia and Washington are getting the brunt of it today. And uh, to them, we say, in your face, because it certainly was not fun to have it yesterday. Yeah, it was, t- it was, yeah, it was like, it felt like the apocalypse. It was like 1 p.m. and it was dark and orange out. Like, it was weird. Uh, one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced. But, um, yeah, it looks a little bit better today. I haven't been outside, so I don't know what the air is actually like. But, uh, yeah, weird couple days. No, nor have I. I'm probably going to keep it that way for a little bit. But it, if you weren't here yesterday, you might not have understood how ridiculous it was when MLB's offices, which, by the way, are also here, we're sort of having like a three o'clock, four o'clock discussion of we're going to go ahead and talk to the Yankees and White Sox and talk to the teams involved and see if we're going to need to move this thing a little bit. It was actively orange. It looked like it looked like Mars and it didn't really take like Rob Manford didn't really need to go outside, lick his finger, put it up to the sky and go, yep, still orange. OK, I guess we'll bag this one. Like it wasn't that complex. No, it really wasn't. I don't, yeah, I don't know what took them so long. I went for a walk early in the morning and I, and I was, it stung my nostrils to breathe. So, uh, yeah, not, not the best atmosphere for baseball. No, according to first name, whole bunch of numbers, it was just another example of the wussification of modern athletes. Yeah. But according to most of us out here walking through the streets of New York, it was uh, just extremely uncomfortable to breathe. So it, it is what it is. I will say that if the Yankees did play, it would have looked cool on TV at least. It wouldn't yeah. look like they were playing on Mars. Yeah, I was I was at the game on Tuesday. Uh, I would say that was an ill-advised decision by me. Uh, I got free tickets. I, I wanted I actually turned them down once and then they circled back to me with like a you sure you don't want to and I was kind of like, "Ah, uh, you know what? Like, eh, what the hey? You know, it's only a couple hours out of my day." And by the time I got up to Yankee Stadium, it didn't look orange, but it was apocalyptically gray. And y- y- I was putting sunglasses on at 5 p.m. Uh, just to kind of shield my eyes from whatever that was. And then we watched the whole baseball game, and it was almost a no hitter. So uh, probably not the right call. Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> hey, what, what are you gonna do? Uh, well, if you're joining us on the show, we're gonna be talking about Ellie De La Cruz because how could we not be talking about? Ellie De La Cruz. Uh, we're also going to touch on Alec Manoa's demotion a little bit below the depths that any of us thought he'd be demoted to. Jacob DeGrom's future and the Rangers present. Luis Arise's chase for 400 and the AL Central is entirely under the 500 mark. Uh, so we got plenty to get into. If you are someone who is going to take our advice today and use it to dictate your future bets and you're in a legal betting state, we've got an offer for you with Bet365. We have an awesome promo uh, for this week. All you have to do is deposit $10 as long as you are in a legal betting state and place a $1 wager on any sport. Could be baseball, could be relevant to today's discussion. Maybe you want to get in on the 2-1 NBA Finals. It is your call. But if you do that, you place that $1 wager, you will instantly receive $200 added to your account in bonus bets. Whether you win or lose, all you have to do is use the code BASEBALLIN at sign up. Uh, to be perfectly clear, that is baseball in. Like, I'm balling. It's baseball. Baseball in. By using that code, you not only receive the $200 in bonuses, but you will also be directly supporting the podcast. So if you haven't signed up for Bet365, join with the code baseball in and place that first bet. This offer is available for new customers who are 21 plus and physically present in most legally gambling states. Please remember to always gamble responsibly. Check the episode description for the full terms of the offer. And uh, Ian, let's start just because uh, we will get to the exciting stuff, but just because you are a Toronto Blue Jays fan, your team is rolling a little bit now, so it's probably a less uncomfortable time to deal with the hard truths of the Alec Manoa situation. Uh, easier to demote him in the middle of a an extended winning stretch and some nice games against the Houston Astros. 
Chris Bassett, Kevin Gossman more than picking up the slack, but Manoa had to go. There was some abstract discussion about maybe end up demoting him after this particularly rough third of an inning start against Houston. Not only does he get demoted, but he gets demoted to the Florida Complex League, which is just sort of the the instructional league. He's basically got demoted to pitching school. Um, that has to be, even as you anticipated his demotion, that has to be further than you thought he was going. Yeah, it, 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 it is, but it's not. Now that I've kind of looked into it a little bit, I, I actually think it's kind of the right move because now he can kind of focus on not necessarily pitching games and just kind of stripping things down and starting from scratch at some of their best facilities that the franchise has. Uh, things to be able to examine his pitching, you know, um, as closely as possible. So I didn't expect it. And I thought it was like when I saw it, I was like, oh, sheesh that's tough but once i look into it and i i read stuff from you know blue jays insiders i think in, i think it's probably the best move people do talk up those facilities in dunedin and i think apparently they are the best professional facilities uh this side of the you know the actual just the big league complex which is funny because they did play down there for a bit during the strange stages the middle stages of the pandemic they played more of those games in buffalo though it kind of feels like maybe they should have just stuck down in Dunedin in Florida if those were such professional uh facilities um what what's to blame here it, because this is a, a drastic year over year change some people are just sort of obliquely blaming the pitch clock um because it's the most obvious change from year to year I don't think we really have any data to say oh yes that is the right thing to blame here um and a lot of that is sort of just Honestly, it feels somewhat lazy. It feels just like Manoa's a big guy, right? So probably gets tired. So, you know, pitch clock, that's new. Um, but it, it does seem like pitch quality is going down pretty markedly, as, as you've uh, pointed out. Yeah, it, it's it's his slider is what it's come down to. Um, that was his best pitch of, of his career through his first two years. That has now become his worst pitch. Um, and I actually encourage people who want to look into this even more. A guy by the name of Chris Black at down to black on Twitter did a deep dive um, of the mechanics of his slider this season. And, and that's why I'm actually not too concerned about Manoa right now. If he can go down to the Florida complex and strip things down and step away from the game and really focus on that slider and get that dialed back in, he's going to be okay because it's not like he's falling apart all over the place. It's really that one pitch that he, and it's not that far off. Um, looking through these tweets it like comes it comes down to like the plane that it's that it's coming out of his arm and if anyone's a golfer like i am i when you're like driver is slicing all day and you can't fix it sometimes you just need to step away from actually playing rounds of golf and just going to the driving range for a week and really stripping down your swing and i think that's kind of where alec Mano is at where he's not gonna be able to fix this issue in the majors on the blue jays when he needs to pitch a game once every four to five days. Now that he can step back and really take his time and strip down his his pitch uh, mechanics a little bit and really start from scratch, I think he's going to be okay. Because like I said, it is just the slider. And even on top of that, he's been getting a lot of, a lot of bad luck on batted balls. Uh, so it's not 100% a disaster. His slider needs to get dialed in just a little bit more. And other than that, some bad luck on batted balls. Uh, and I think he's going to be okay. So obviously it's not ideal. Um, I would rather he wasn't having this issue, but I'm not re ready to say that he's not going to once again be the Blue Jays ace. Uh, I think he can s sort this issue out because it's really just that one pitch. The rest of his stuff is generally as good as it was the past couple of years. So I'm, I'm not out on Manoa. He's also not the first pitcher to get punched in the mouth by the Houston Astros. So it, it, the, the timing yeah. is poor, but he's certainly not the first guy to experience discomfort there. He, he shut the Yankees down through seven innings of two hit ball earlier in the year through a seven inning, one hitter against the Royals went five and two thirds with two earned against the Orioles. There are moments against uh, the Royals or the Royals, but the Yankees and Orioles are strong offenses. He dominated them. There are, there are games on his resume this year where you look at it and go, well, well, that's that's fine. So it's not like he has uniformly been awful every time he has taken the mound. He just has struggled, has struggled with the slider, and it saved his worst start for last, which ultimately forced him into making a decision. Yeah, I think the move probably – I think they were a little late sending him down. Um, I think putting him out against the Astros was – 
I bet on the Astros in that game pretty big because I was like, this is this is going to be a disaster. This is not going to be an issue that's that's going to get fixed until he takes a step away. So I'm glad they finally did it. I think it was one game too late, though. Yes. Uh, the, the AL East loses a villain here. Um, I think everybody sort of wants wants him back. But you're eyeing uh, Hyunjin Ryu coming back to maybe fill that rotation spot. Uh, is there a timeline on that? When, when can we maybe expect that move? Yeah, I think latest report is he's hoping to come back after the All-Star break. Apparently, he's progressing pretty well. But a lot of people have kind of forgot about Hyun Jin Ryu. Um, guy who was, I think, runner-up to the Cy Young his first year with the Jays, or maybe it was his last year with the Dodgers. But a guy who's been a Cy Young contender for a couple of years, a guy who hasn't pitched for the Jays now for uh, a while, he's still lurking around. If he can come back and get, maybe not to his you know Cy Young contender form, but if he can at least give the Jays, another option in the rotation that they're comfortable with. A guy that they can put out and say, you know, he's probably going to have a solid start most of the times that he goes out there. Uh, that's going to be a huge addition for the Blue Jays down the stretch. So it's looking like after the All-Star break, he, he might come back. And I think that, that that's going to give the Jays a huge boost. If we can get him back in good form and then Manoa figures his thing out down in Florida and he comes back for the final stretch of the season, at the end of the day, the Jays are most likely going to be in the playoffs so it's going to be about how we're going to play the final month of the season and into the playoffs because as we saw with the Phillies last year what it's all about is getting hot at the right time and with the Jays you know with those guys coming back if they come back in good form we could get hot at the right time great point on on Ryu yeah he, he was second in the Cy Young race the year before he came to Toronto and then in the shortened season finished third right. but I think a lot of people tune that out because you know, a short in 2020, I think gets memory hold by a lot of people. Uh, yeah. He was once again, you know, above average in ERA. And ERA plus at a 102 in 2021. A season where, like you said, not a Cy Young caliber pitcher. But every time he goes out there, you're fairly confident the start is going to be competent. And missed last year, missed this year. So, uh, I mean, if they can get the 2021 version of him back, that's all they really need. And that's certainly better than what Manoa has been giving them. Yeah, listen, we don't need him to be, we don't need uh, Ryu to be our ace. We got, we got Gosman, we got, hopefully Manoa can get back into form here. So we just need a solid guy in the back end of our rotation and that'll be perfect. Let's talk about Ellie, because uh, I don't know how I've suppressed talking about him this deep into the podcast. It's probably, it's kind of all I want to talk about. Uh, the Reds lose today, uh, just wrapped a little bit ago. They, they get blanked by the Dodgers. That's no harm, no foul. The Dodgers are very good. They not going to lose every single day, but the Reds win maybe the most, the two most dramatic games of the young season so far, erasing big deficits in both end up with a walk-off homer by Will Benson last night. Last night's game marked uh, Dela Cruz's second game in the bigs and his first career home run. Sometimes you just turn on a game and you know, you are watching something special. I'm very grateful that I popped the Reds on for the first inning of that one. I, I didn't want to miss his first AB. And just as they were sort of talking, the announcers had a perfect setup for the De La Cruz homer. They were kind of talking about how there had been hushed tones in the ballpark the day before, rather than outright rampant joy, because everybody was just sort of in awe at what this player was doing. And he chose that exact pitch to go 458 to the final row of the outfield for his first career home run. A, a majestic look a home run you have to show people so that they can believe it. It's not enough to know it went that far and Dela Cruz is a top prospect. People got to get their eyes on this one to understand the full scope. He's celebrated after the game at a Cincinnati steakhouse wearing a Bratz t-shirt. He was born in 2002. This is the most important <laughs> thing in Major League Baseball right now, and I, I don't think that we can ignore uh, how revolutionary it is for Cincinnati to have a talent like this, at least for now. But it makes the rest of their season with Matt McClain, who is a Rookie of the Year candidate, Corbin Carroll, and, and the people who got the opening day head start are the front runners. But McClain, now that he's qualified, is right up there. De La Cruz is playing. Jonathan India is still there. Spencer Steer is putting up a great rookie year. Andrew Abbott just debuted with six shutout. I think you have to watch the Reds in a very strange division. Yeah, you do. And on, on De La Cruz specifically, me being a, a betting man, what stood out to me is the guy's played in two games and he's immediately second on the odds list to win NL Rookie of the Year. Immediately. Missed the first two plus months of the season. Doesn't matter. 
he's that electric. Odds makers were like, yep, we're putting him right there close to the top. Uh, still second on the odds list to Corbin Carroll, uh, who's about minus 135. But Dilla Cruz is as short as plus 300, three to one to win rookie of the year. And he's two games uh, into his season. So uh, he's electric. Hey, man, he's fun. And this Reds team as a whole, kind of a fun team. Maybe not the best team in the National League, maybe not a playoff team. But they're fun, and that's what we need in baseball is more fun teams. It's a tough one because the comment section, look, they're they're right, right? Uh, I don't think Scott Boris loves having a primetime talent like De La Cruz in Cincinnati. Uh, I think that we have seen this story before. Eventually, the fun young core gets broken up. They're not going to come to below market extensions with everybody after year one. This will eventually get dicey. But to that, I say enjoy this while it lasts right. this is cincinnati's plan to draft and develop and sign 16 year olds on the international market and make sure that it all coalesces at the exact same time so i don't know if this is going to last forever but it can last three years right and and their master plan is for year one to be exciting year two and three to be part of the contention window and then we'll worry about tomorrow when tomorrow comes it's not a model owner. It's not somebody who I, I'm not happy that we've entrusted this ownership group with this crown jewel, De La Cruz and the young talent around him, but all the more reason to be focused on the here and now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the best thing the Reds could hope for is uh, a couple seasons of hope. And if, you know, at best hope, you know, at worst, some excitement, some fun teams to watch. So just enjoy it while it lasts for sure and enjoy the ride. Um, it's a shame that they don't have an owner where, or they do have a guy where they know it's not going to last. That's that stinks. I don't think those kinds of owners should be allowed to own teams, but here we are at least enjoy it while it lasts. So it's, it's the best you can hope for. Yeah. And these are good fans uh, that they, they look, have fun for the rest of the season, have fun for next season. It, it's really all you can ask for um, specifically spotlighting some good fans in Cincinnati um, the people in the back row of the stadium who caught De La Cruz's first home run. First of all, the, the kid in the back row who probably never anticipated that one coming his way, the ball do doinked off his hand at first, which is a nightmare. Like, imagine being that close to catching De La Cruz's first home run, and then the moment actually arrives, and it bounces off your hands. You just have to hope nobody's around you. Luckily, nobody was. He recovered quickly. He snagged it. Him and his boys celebrated. He negotiated... For the home run ball with De La Cruz, a meet and greet, easy, signed bat, signed hat, signed balls for him and the whole crew, and signed photos for him and all the friends as well. The friends got to pose with De La Cruz, who uh, looks exceptionally cool holding the ball up dead center while the rest of the Reds, uh, college age boys, I don't know who these, maybe these are seniors in high school, having a great day at the ballpark. That kind of sounds like a large collection of De La Cruz items. I personally don't need the baseball. I'm in the highlight forever, right? Um, the, the, there's video of me catching it. People know I did it. I don't really need the ball. I think I make that trade. I, I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people on Twitter saying that he should have negotiated harder. I think, listen, it's not a record-breaking home run like with Aaron Judge last year. Like, I don't know if he would have got, like, if he would have just kept the ball and sold it, I don't know how much money he would have got for it. I think it's a decent trade. Um, I, he, yeah, he got the memory. He got some memorabilia. He got a pitcher. Yeah, he looked out for his friends. I think that's kind of the best that you could hope for. I mean, maybe he could have squeezed out tickets to the next game or something like that. But um, yeah, I, I think that's all you can hope for. Like I said, not a record-breaking home run. So I think that would be a little bit of a different situation. I think I, I think he got a decent deal. And this isn't, it's not a record-breaking home run. Judge 62 last year went to some like investment banker guy who was married to a bachelor contestant. Mm. That's not what you want. What you want is for these, these some guys to just grab the De La Cruz ball and get to go down and meet him. Uh, it's a haul. It's a memorabilia haul. It's a lot of stuff. If I go home with the guy who caught the ball, got four De La Cruz autographs. I think I'll, I think I'll probably take that. Have you ever caught a ball? This is a great question because when we were at the game on Tuesday in the smog, we were in a perfect foul ball section and figured this might be the time. I've never, we, we didn't. One came pretty damn close, but we didn't get it. I've never gotten a ball at a major league game. I caught a ball off the rebound of the back wall at a Trenton Thunder game when I was in high school. And then technically Jason Giambi, when he was on Oakland, I had box seats at Yankee Stadium 
tossed a ball that I ended up with, but he did not toss it to me. He tossed it to a rich kid who then looked around and was like, I have a lot of these. Does, does anybody oh want this? God. And he gave it to us. So I don't even think that counts. So one at a major league game wasn't given to me and one at a minor league game. Uh, I don't know. What about you? Um, no, I had to live through my absolute nightmare to Yankees game this season, actually. I came in, I think it was one of the, I think mid-April, I think it was. Um, I was sitting in foul ball territory down the first base line and I got up to get a sausage. And while I was in line to get a sausage to fill my fat mouth with food, a foul ball literally hit my empty chair. <laughs> my girlfriend ducked. She had no desire to try to catch it. And it hit my vacant empty chair and then bounced out to like a couple rows in front of us. Cause I was yep. up trying to buy a sausage. <laughs> yep. That's not just, what you want. Just disgusted with myself. I, I actually, I don't know why I left this off the list. I just, I just caught another minor league ball like, like two weeks ago. I got my second minor league ball. Um, there you go. But it wasn't, it wasn't a fun occurrence because we were sitting in seats that didn't belong to us. We moved into shade seats. And of course the ball came right there at the Hudson Valley Renegades game. Hit my mom <laughs> who put her hands on her head. Uh, it hit her head, but it actually hit her hand. So it hit one finger, rolled away, and I picked up the ball. But couldn't really think about the fact that I had the ball and honestly forgot that I wound up with it until right now because we had uh, EMS guys by us for a while just being like, you sure you're good, ma'am? Or you sure you're fine? Your finger fine? Uh, so less than fun. I would actually give that ball away. If somebody wanted it, they can have it. Was she okay? She was. She was. Okay. Uh, she, she got a nice pack. A uh, nice EMS guy visited us like two or three times. Kind of hospitality you can only expect to get at a minor league baseball game. Uh, sure. But I kind of wish that it had hit an empty chair. That's the one instance where empty chair is the preferred yes, outcome. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I am glad I hit the empty chair instead of my girlfriend ducking for sure. But also yes. maybe I, I'm very scared now to get up and get any kind of concessions at baseball <laughs> games because I cannot let that happen twice. No. Yankees will make you wait too. Like a sausage should be so easy, but for some reason that's nope. still like a 15 minute ordeal. Yes. Correct. Yeah. They, they know what they're doing. They, they, I actually don't, I don't know if they know what they're doing. I don't know why they want you to wait in line, but they do. Um, yeah. Listen, I got a lot of issues with the Yankee stadium, but that's maybe that's a conversation for another day. I got a lot of problems with you people. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's not the best. I actually kind of want to go kind of want, I definitely want to go check up the improvements in Toronto. I, I kind of yes. pegged, uh there's a weekend in july that my dad and i were looking at i don't know if have you been to the new ballpark yet new no ballpark. i have not no okay um yeah i kind of want to see that stuff it's like a it's a d-backs game i think it's in the middle of july i might do a little road trip I'll, I'll report back if i do awesome i will not be in toronto at all this summer so i i won't see it this year maybe next year <laughs> no no worries don't don't turn your summer around to come to that <laughs> july game with me and my dad totally fine um let's let's talk about the rangers i want to pivot there um, because it's crazy. We're having so much joy in baseball this week. A lot of the focus is on De La Cruz and rightly so, but we may have seen a hall of fame career go up in smoke. Uh, not, not to be dramatic, but Jacob deGrom needs Tommy John surgery. Uh, Mets fans have gone through the Jacob deGrom roller coaster. They have gone through the grimacing every time he leaves the game, uh, for something that ends up being minor or something that ends up being somewhere in between, but somehow he did, he had Tommy John right when he started his professional career at the lowest levels of the minors. Didn't need it again until now, until he gets that contract with the Rangers. And he is 34. When he comes back, he will be 36. He has a Sandy Koufax peak, even with the modern statistics and the way that we evaluate win-loss record these days. I don't think 84 wins is enough to get him into the Hall. You I don't think, think he going... gets in the Hall of Fame? I don't think he gets enough. I mean, it depends on what happens. If he comes back and he can give us three more seasons of 15 and eight baseball and get himself up to 130, then I guess I'll entertain it for the peak stuff. But I mean, right now, 84 wins and just about, it, it's like, it literally is 10 years right on the dot of dominance. I don't think it's good enough. But so many years of the Mets, he was getting no run support in his games. Like, do, do they still evaluate? I mean, I, I don't pay attention to the Baseball Hall of Fame that much. I know it's hard to get into, but do they still evaluate wins that highly? Because I remember when he was with the Mets, like, they'd lose games one nothing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be one of those things. It, it would turn into a certified thing, right? Like, you right. would have people advocating for, if you were there, you know. And if you have the advanced stats, you know. Come on. 
And then you would have other people, traditionalists, but even moderate traditionalists saying, I mean, I think he would be the low man in wins in the Hall of Fame by like 70. Sandy Koufax has 150. So like, it's, it's not even like, come on, let it slide. He's a little light. It's like, it would be changing the makeup of the Hall completely. Yeah, fair enough. That's crazy to me, but yeah, fair enough. So who knows? And, and again, he will come back. Uh, as Justin notes, you know, it's, it's, it's not the end of his career. It just might mark a significant downturn for him. That said, the Texas Rangers haven't really had him this year. They have been just fine without him. The offense isn't just dominating. It's reaching 1930s Yankees levels of run differential to this point in the season. It's, it's like the 36 Yankees, the 27 Yankees, and the Texas Rangers are right in the middle of them. Uh, they feel like a playoff lock to me right now, regardless. Uh, they were surviving and thriving without Jagram. But does this make you feel like when they get to the – like, do you think this is great regular season, tough time projecting them in the postseason without Degrom in the rotation? Or are you confident enough in the aces that they still do have Evaldi, Gray? I mean, they are not just surviving without Degrom right now. I, I still believe in this team in the postseason. I would believe in them, <clears throat> excuse me, early in the postseason, but once you get to the later rounds and it's best of seven series, I think it's going to be tough for them because I, I just don't trust the back end of this rotation very much. I mean, is Dane Dunning going to continue to have a 252 <laughs> ERA? Like, I don't know. That's going to be tough. I mean, at the end of the day, though, if they can keep winning shootouts with that offense, now I don't think, I mean, I think this offense is very good and I think this offense is very deep. Uh, which is something that I think my Blue Jays are lacking. The bottom part of our lineup has not kind of lived up to our, the expectations. This Rangers team from top to bottom, very solid. Um, I think they might regress a little bit, but I still think their offense can carry them. But at the end of the day, especially later on in the postseason, um, I think I think the back end of the rotation might come back to haunt them a little bit. And also, I, this is kind of a cliche. I don't know how much I believe it, but generally i feel like you have to learn how to lose before you can learn how to win at least that's how i'm justifying the playoff losses for the blue jays the past couple seasons can a team like the rangers go from you know not a good team to all of a sudden a world series contender in one year i don't know i feel you there and a shout out to a lot of the hot take artists many of them from new york who spent uh degrom's free agency writing about how uh degrom chased the money and he didn't want to win and he went to a low pressure system in Texas. And oh, look, all of a sudden the Rangers are like 40 and 20, one of the most dominant offenses we've ever seen. And the Mets are a bottom five least interesting team in Major League Baseball so far this season. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised people weren't giving Rangers any any respect heading into the season. I actually um I placed one futures bet on every single team in Major League Baseball. My bet on the Rangers was that for them to make the playoffs at just under two to one. I I thought they were being underrated heading into the season. Obviously, I didn't think they were gonna be this good. Uh, they're shocking how, how good this offense has been. But I, I was kind of surprised um, that they weren't really getting any credit heading into the year. And, you know, they've surpassed everyone's expectations. And a reminder, if you do want to explore a futures bet like that and make your own, the code baseball in on bet365. We have a special promo for all you viewers, listeners to the podcast. You could join us here Mondays and Thursdays at 3.30 Eastern get your view on but if you're just subscribed to the audio feed this is for you as well as long as you are in a legal betting state see the full terms of the agreement at bet365 or in the description below but make sure to just sign up with the code baseball in uh, and you will get some bonus bets simply for making that ten dollar deposit and one dollar wager uh, if you've got something that you'd like to explore on the flip side of what the rangers and astros are doing in the west uh just before we went live today the Minnesota Twins lost to the Tampa Bay Rays. Shocker. Uh, somebody lost the Rays in Tampa at the Trop. Stunning. Uh, that puts the Twins at 31 and 32 on the season. Kind of a bummer. Under 500. Uh, good run differential, but not a lot to show for it. Luckily for them, they are under 500 and leading the AL Central. Because the Tigers and the Guardians also significantly under. Five or six games under. Uh, the White Sox are 20 and 14 since April 30th but they started so poorly that they are 27 and 35 and also well under this division is a disaster class. It still lines up. It's June 8th and it still lines up behind the entire AL East. The Red Sox are 31 and 31 and the twins are 31 and 32. So it just goes East central 
Uh, somebody's got to win this thing, though. And for too long, I've just been saying, well, you look at the metrics, it's the Twins. I mean, the Twins will eventually win this, right? Well, they'll turn on the offense. Will, the offensive pitching will click at the right time. They'll take this division. It, it's June 8th, and I'm still waiting. Uh, is that still the prevailing wisdom, or have we opened the door here for somebody else? Yeah, I think I, I think I honestly kind of like the White Sox now to win that division. I do too. Uh, their bullpen has been crap. They got to fix their bullpen, but I, just looking at this division just it angers me. I can feel my blood pressure going up because here we are, Yankees and Blue Jays battling in the AL East to our deaths. And all, any team in the AL East would be winning the AL Central. It's not fair. It's not fair. None of these teams in the AL Central should be in the in the playoffs. But if I had to choose one right now. I think it's probably the White Sox. Uh, they've been the hottest team lately. Um, I guess them. Yeah, I like them. I do. I like the White Sox. Um, you know, look, is this recency bias because I just watched the White Sox play Yankee Stadium? Yeah, but you you do go up and down the White Sox lineup. And at least you look at the names being penciled in every single day and you right. go, the top six is it's good. It's all like, it's all like good quality baseball players. And, you, you know, I wasn't watching them when they were 13 or 14 under. And that ESPN Chicago guy was making that legendary call, uh, just screaming for 20 unhinged minutes about how this never gets better. And it's an endless cycle perpetuating, <laughs> uh, you know, year after year. And the ownership has to feel the uh, guillotine. It's a classic call. But at the end of the day, I do think this is probably the most talented team in the Central. I think they end up in a similar range where the Twins are. I think the Twins gear it up a little bit too as the year goes on but uh i i believe in the white Sox right now yeah that would be my i mean i don't believe in any team in the division but i <laughs> i'll take the white Sox at this point i guess i mean look they're they're gonna they're not winning the uh they're not getting the buy right so they're getting in a two-game series uh they're gonna have to face off with somebody in the in the comments it's, it's somebody it's it's either houston or texas or some dominant al east team i mean they're not gonna have much fun uh, they seem to have the Yankees number a little bit here, but that is also extremely small sample size uh, fear mongering from last year and this year. So who really I will say that? in terms of the betting odds, twins still pretty big favorites, a minus 200 to win this division. So uh, if you want to bet on the White Sox, bet 365 promo code baseball in seven to one on the White Sox. Uh, so plus 700 for them to win the division. And now is the bet. time. Now's yeah, the get time. Them, Do it now. Get them, get them while they're still under 500, which they'll, they'll be for a significant chunk of time because they are still eight games under 500 entering the smog games today. Uh, that is it for today's edition of the Baseball Insiders. Uh, right before we go, Luis Arise, I, I just want to say this out loud while it's still happening. He's hitting 400. Luis Arise is hitting 400. I don't know if he'll still be hitting 400 by the time I get to do a podcast on Monday. And the next time we get together. So I just want to say that he's hitting 403 with a 161 OPS plus right now. It is worth three war. And, and that's really happening. Uh, I still, the, the as a betting man, I'm sure that you know the bet is bet against him hitting 400 on the season. Uh, but I think he's probably edged up to what? Like a like a 5 to 10% chance of this happening instead of 1 to 2, right? Yeah, I would say 5%, 7%. Um, I actually tried to see if any sports books were off were actually offering betting odds on it. I couldn't find any. Maybe they exist out there. Maybe I just didn't look deep enough. But yeah, it's seven percent. It'll be. So, I, I hope it lasts a little bit longer. So it's it'll be something to watch down the stretch. But uh, unbelievable. What's the best batting average of all time in the season? Oh man, I mean nobody has hit four hundred since Ted Williams hit four hundred six in forty one. Uh, but there, I mean, back in the day when everybody was going insane, like Bill Terry and those guys were hitting 420, right? 430, you know, George Sisler, I think maybe has the highest ever. Uh, I guess Bill Terry only hit 400 once, so I'm a fool. Uh, let me get some George Sisler averages for you before we sign off. That's so uh, last time someone hit over 400 was when you said 1941. Okay, so yeah, that's unbelievable. George Brett almost did it and finished at 393. Tony Gwynn had it in 94 through the strike. Like he was damn close. I think he finished at 390, but there was a significant chance he would end up making a late season push and we never got to see whether that happened or not. Sisler, the year he won the MVP hit 420. Uh Blaze it. He also hit 47 407 2 years earlier. I mean, people used to do it in the 10s and 20s 
Ted Williams did it in 41, and we basically say goodbye ever since. Crazy. So is is a rise Tony Gwynn? Uh, I don't know. I know that he has Tony Gwynn savant page. Everyone, uh, the savant heads out there laughing at the stat cast blue circles for, uh, you know, hard hit rate. Uh, meanwhile, his expected batting average is in the 100th percentile, breaking the red line like a thermometer exploding. So, uh, yeah, for the people circulating those screenshots asking if Luis Arise is good, he's good. And for now, he's hitting 400. And, and I just wanted to say that out loud. I'd like to have a 400 hitter on the Blue Jays. I'll take that. Yeah, and he was available this offseason. People could have just gone and gotten him, but they uh, didn't. Uh, well, guess what? We'll see you on Monday. Hopefully when we see you, Luis Arise is still hitting 400 because it's fun to say out loud. Hopefully Ella Dela Cruz is another eye-opening moment or two over the weekend. And hopefully the Reds get themselves back in the central race. Ian, I appreciate you joining me as always, man. And I hope that we kept the Alec Manoa uh, sad spiral segment to a relative minimum. I have hope. I have hope, my friend. I do too. Come on. Uh, it was just there last year. It was just there in April against the Yankees. It'll, it'll yeah. be there again. Um, I appreciate you joining me. I appreciate all the viewers joining us. We will be back Monday at 3.30 Eastern, uh, 3.30 every Monday, Thursday, again, on all audio platforms, podcast feed. If you're a subscriber, we thank you. We thank you for watching and commenting. Active comment section again today. You people rule. And until next Monday, enjoy the weekend.